I thought it would be nice to start with just a sort of sense of what maybe each of, asking each of you what it is that you admire or get from each other's work, just to sort of start off by framing it, and then and then we'll sort of I've got a load of topics, things that have come up over the last couple of days that we can kind of tap, tap into and yeah, get through as much as we can. But maybe who would like to start? I can start because I'm the f I'm the one who would became learned of John in a weird kind of funny way because I. I started, I did this thing about zombies, and I was addressing zombies in a very similar way as him, and then someone said, have you heard of John Verveke? He did this thing about zombies. And so I listened to him, you had written a, a little book, and then there was also some videos, yeah. and it was exactly what I was trying to get to, and I thought, this is wonderful, like he really has this insight. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute, he's, he's worked with Jordan Peterson, you know, it, it all kind of came together. and. Uh, and I just felt like he gave a great vocabulary for the things that I wanted to talk about because sometimes I have these intuitions and there aren't always words, or words are sometimes too imprecise and so it's slippery. But what, one of the things that John has done is that he's really created a powerful vocabulary to talk about the things. And so when I don't know what, what to say, sometimes I'll just reach it, I'll like have my little John Ravicki dictionary, <laughs> like reach into that dictionary and, and pull in a word. So that's one, but I think that, that at, at, that's what at the outset attracted me to John. But then after that, there's so much more. I think that what John's doing in terms of consciousness and bringing the importance of consciousness to the fore, this notion of relevance and relevance realization, I think it's really falling into the right moment in so many ways, right? There are all these fields that are culminating towards that, and I think that his work is crucial to, to, to make sense of everything. So as much in the technology field with the question of AI or the, the question of, of intelligent machines, but then also the whole problem of social media, the whole problem of the media landscape as being related to attention, you realize that understanding relevance and understanding how relevance works and the manner in which we engage with the world is so important for us to make sense of what's going on and to not just be tools in this machine cog, the, the cog in this machine that's running and we don't know what's going on. You know, we, get, we go down our phone and we, we just fall into these, these framed uh, methods of getting your attention. We don't realize that we're just playing the game and we're just feeding the system. And so I think that one of the things that John is offering is a, is a mechanism for us to, to be able to step back and understand what that is. So that's one. And then ultimately, I would say in terms of his approach to conversation and his just genuine openness, you know, like all the conversations we've had and we've acknowledged our differences, we know where we stand and we kind of laugh about it and we smile about it. Um, but then we always go further in and, and deeper into, into the conversations. And so, the, and so I think that he's just been such a precious conversation partner and bringing my own ideas you know, because sometimes it won't happen in the conversation. Like we have the conversation, we kind of test each other, we push each other a bit, and then I go away, and then I realize a week later that, okay, yeah, this has changed, or this, this way of thinking has refined itself at least. And so, so yeah, so I, I, I'm really happy that he, that I've I'm, I'm been really excited to see the attention that he's been getting more and more, and, and I think that, especially his conversation with, also with, with Paul, uh, Paul Vanderclay, I keep having the V wanting to go to Verveke or Vanderclay, with Paul Vanderclay and all these other people, and you as well, and all this, this little, what do they call it, the little corner of the internet yes, or whatever. The of the yeah. Yeah. I think that that's been wonderful uh, for us, but then also for the people that have, been, have found some threads and some, you know, some crumbs to, to kind of sustain them on their journey, so yeah. So uh, I, I saw Jonathan talking about me um, and talking about the book I wrote with, uh, with Christopher Mastapietro and Philip Misovic. And, uh, and so I reached out to him. And then uh, he invited me pretty soon thereafter to uh, come on his channel and we had our first discussion. And, and, and uh, I remember after the, discussion, the discussion was really powerful. And then I remember afterwards, when the, when the video ended, I realized, Oh, I'm I'm missing Jonathan. Like, <laughs> I I really really like uh, being in his presence and interacting with him. Um, so, I have one of my defining defining features of Dialogos is that both people can get to a place they couldn't get to on their own. That doesn't mean they come to agreement. Mm. That's the mistake to think no we we failed because we don't agree on all these propositions. Um, 
uh, I, 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 I think that's the, the incorrect goal. But I always feel that I, I do that when, uh, uh, when I'm in discussion with Jonathan. Jonathan makes, um, he makes good-hearted and good critiques of my work. And I appreciate them. This is not me being defensive at all. Jonathan will say something like, well, John seems to be overly individualistic in how he's understanding spirituality. He's leaving out the ecclesia. And I'll go, that's really good. That's really good. And I'll take it to heart. I might not respond the way he does, wanted me to respond, but I'll take it to heart. And I'll say, no, that's an important point. And that, that always happens with, when I'm interacting with Jonathan. I'll hear, I'll hear like, I'll hear genuine, well, what about this? And I'll go, hmm, that's something missing from my thought, or that's a way in which I've misapprehended or even mistaken something. And so, and Jonathan does it in a way that's always done with affection and respect. So he's committed as much, for me, I sense this in him, this is how it is for me. The being in right relationship with Jonathan is more important than being right about something, right? Um, and um, I feel that, I feel that, in, in, with him too. And his work, um, uh, his work on symbolism, I, I, I say this and people don't get it, and I say it half jokingly, but only half jokingly. Jo people don't realize how radical Jonathan is, I, I think. I think, uh, like, J Jonathan is, right, the, 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 what he, he is, he is trying to get people, like, I hope you take this as a compliment. You remind me of Goethe in that you're trying to get people to this fundamental new way of seeing the world that isn't just a way of having new propositions, but a, like seeing the world like in, in this fundamentally different and profound way, and that um, and that you actually have the courage and the integrity as a believing Christian to nevertheless mount a criticism of aspects of Christianity because of how they have lost the symbolic sense. And I admire that about you. Um, and, and again, you don't do that in any, with any hostility, but you do it with Integrity, but and I think the the point about um, symbolism uh, and the way symbolism happens, as you put it, I think this is a really profound thing, and I, and I, I think it it intersects with the work I do on relevance, realization, and sacredness, and meaning in in a really really um, mutually beneficial fashion, um, and um, and then as I said. Um, the, the, uh, I want to use an adjective, and I hope people don't hear it the wrong way. There's a sweetness to Jonathan's presence. Like, that's what, one of the things I missed. Like, like once I, I, when I'm not talking with him, that, that kind of goes away. And it's like, it's like, it's like if, if um, you know, you've been, there's been beautiful music playing, and then somebody shuts it off, and you sort of, oh, that, well, that had been sort of, it, it had sort of gone into the warp and woof of my mind without my realizing it. So there's a musicality about how he expresses himself. There's a lyricism. Um, I really want you and, and Chris Master Pietro to talk at some point because Chris is like that too. The, the lyricism is is beautiful. Um, I you know and like I said, I, I Jonathan's ability um, to I, to I aspire. Um, I hope that's the right word. I aspire to follow Socrates in ultimately a Neoplatonic way of life. Uh, and, and, and Jonathan is living it. Now, it's a Christian Neoplatonism, but I think it's still a legitimate form of Neoplatonism. And I think Christian Neoplatonism is a very good thing, so I'm not trying to do a backhanded insult. But Jonathan lives it. And um, I admire that. I almost envy it about him. And so that's also why I like engaging with him. Yeah, I've got so many kind of jumping off points with what you guys have just said, but I just wondered if you wanted to respond to. I mean, I, I, I didn't expect I didn't expect what you said, and I I, I feel I take it definitely to heart, and uh, and I think that that's something. I mean, I do see that we we're also on like a growing friendship, like, yeah, yeah. and I think that that's something that it's, it's one of those things that when the first time we met, we knew it instinctively mm -hmm. that that was happening, and then it's just a question of letting the. You know, just letting the the, the the vase getting filled with 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 time and yeah. anecdotes, and so so I, I appreciate it very much. Thanks. Mm. Yeah, there's so many different jumping off points. You mentioned this sort of this this corner of the internet, yes. which I think is probably a good way of sort of framing it. And lots of people have given it different names, sort of the liminal web or the yeah. sense making web, or lots of different kind of. But the the broadest frame, and I'd love to get your definitions on this as well, 
is what Jim Rutt has called the what's next space. Mm -hmm. This sort of sense of there's a lot of common themes. One is like the whole left by religion, like these sort of deeper questions of purpose and meaning that are not really addressed in modern society. And that sort of seems to be fueling a lot of the attention that, that many of the figures in this space have been getting because they're wrestling with those deeper questions. Um, and how would you, yeah, how would you frame like the, the or delineate this kind of wider space or this wider conversation? I mean, I think that's right. I mean, I, I, I worry that there's a bias because I, I do think the meaning crisis is, is a thing and it's important. And I do think it's kind of that whole, and we have different names for it, but I think we're talking often about very convergent things. I guess one of the things I would add to that is not only the matter, but the manner. Uh, one of the things that seems to typify this corner of, uh, uh, of the internet is um, that we're tr trying to move into what I call dialogos, what I, what, I, what I talked about before, when you know how Jonathan and I interact, and how it takes on a life of its own because we're both seeking mutual movement and to afford each other insight and realization. And, to, and, 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 and then that is in the service of right relationship, right? And that's a fundamentally different ethos than um, well, you know, what you see through most of social media, a lot of uh, the internet. So I think that manner, uh, uh, which I, like I, I, I give the name to, Dialogos, I'm trying to pick up on it, many different things with that term. Um, um, I think that is also an important thing. There's a commitment to that. Mm -hmm. And there's also a commitment to, and this is something neither, I guess it's part of the manner. I think what we're also doing, and, and I'm trying to re, uh, re use a, a term that uh, you know, I got from Christianity. I, I don't think it's insulting to Christianity the way I'm using it. I think there's an attempt to rediscover and revalue fellowship as something distinct from specific friendship or just uh, being a member of a team or part of a corporation or whatever, right? And so there's, because one of the things people often say, especially in more intense versions of like dialectic into dialogos is they'll say, I didn't know that this kind of intimacy existed. It's neither sexual nor familiar nor friendship, but it's important and I've always been craving it. They say that. And so I think another thing this corner of the internet is trying to do is to bring back into prominence the presence and the practice and the value uh, of fellowship. So that's another thing that I, and I don't see that as a, a, a value or even something that's being explored. And um, so for me, I, I use this metaphor of, you know, we're trying to get uh, the courtyard rather than the courtroom, uh, where we're trying to get people who want to sit together and talk deeply and converse and participate in a conversation that takes on a life of its own, it's transformative, and they experience fellowship. Uh, because, of course, that is also something, you know, the Dunbar number, people forget, right, 150, you're not friends with 150 people. I challenge you to be a good friend with 10 people, right? You can't do it. But you're not, they're not just people that are living with you, right? We, 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 I would argue we evolved to, to be in fellowship. And I do think the Ecclesia, the church, was a place that made that I hope this is the right word, Jonathan. I think it made it sacred. There's something sacred about where well, two or three are gathered in my name, right? Right. right? And so I, I think that that's another important aspect of this corner of the internet. Yeah. And one of the things that it's been, it's been, interestingly enough, it's also been moving out of the internet, which is something yes. which is positive and not, and not. Interestingly, too, not moving out in a singular way. No, no. Right? Because it, it could have been something like, you know, some guru or whatever yeah, starts yeah, a thing yeah, and then yeah. he has his group. <laughs> so that's not what's happening. What's happening is you're seeing the estuary groups that Paul is doing. Yes. You have your groups of practices that you're yeah. kind of there. I have, I can see that people in, in the, the people are going back to church too, but not going back to different churches. People are going back into their churches and trying to, and understanding the importance of ecclesia and the importance of, of, of fellowship, and then trying to to, re, to create that at a local level too, because it can't completely exist only online. No, 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 uh, and I agree. And I think one of the evidences of the reality of the rediscovery of fellowship and of dialogos is exactly what you're saying. If it just stood stayed on the internet, I would suspect it's reality. And that's where the practices come in as well. Very much. Sort of the circling or the authentic relating and yep. there is a sort of convergence that you're both pointing to of different practice groups that are maybe kind of becoming interested in a lot of these ideas but have got maybe the embodied practices of fellowship or connection. Yes. yes. And you mentioned Paul van der Klee as well who 
when I sort of described some of the workshops or practices that I was familiar with, he was like, oh yeah, that's that small group in church. That's He was kind of basically saying, yeah, we, we've, we've already got that. We, we don't need that, we've already got that. <laughs> and, and Paul's setting up of the estuary, like, yeah. like Jonathan said, I think is that's really important. I mean- the, the, like, What is the estuary just for? Uh, so uh, an estuary is where uh, salt water and fresh water mix. Yeah. And so the estuary isn't church, but it's a place that's supposed to be where people within the church and people without the church can meet in good faith dialogue and really re where there's we're not going to secret we're not here we're going to convert you right there's no secret agenda and also there's an expectation of people coming in from the world we're not in here to sort of you know debunk your christianity but it's no like like it's it's like no can we enter into genuine dialogos and can we facilitate the formation of fellowship and then how will that transform us and then how can right People might go into the church, they might not. Uh, people might leave the church, that's also happened with estuary. But what happens is how do people go back to where they go back home? And, and is what's happening in estuary gonna transfer back and transfer their home life? And that's, that's the important thing for estuary, as far as I understand it. So these are people meeting online or meeting in person? I think both. Project? I think I both. Think both. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But they do try to have uh, in-person yeah. meetings as well, yes. that's my understanding. Yes. Yeah. And I wanted to raise a criticism that came up as I was, because I completely agree with you about there is a form as well. It's not yeah. just the content, it is the form and it's the yeah. way that these conversations are had. But I've spent a bit of time kind of dialing into what Peter Lindbergh and I have dubbed the critique sphere, yeah, yeah. which is sort of a group of people who've kind of emerged and I think often have very valid criticisms sure. of some of the figures in this space and some of the kind of focus on, and one of the criticisms they make is what they call civility porn that a lot of the time like this focus on kind of manners or the way that we interact actually can mask divisions and sometimes kind of difficult conversations are not had or sure, sure. Um, yeah that's one of the criticisms I think is worth raising. I think, they get, I, think, I think they get the cart before the horse. I think the deep, if you want deep differences to be deeply discussed in a way that might be transformative there has to be trust. And they, they're not getting, so they're, they're putting the cart before the horse in the criticism. And it's like, and it is not that we lack debate in our society. That, and, and that's the presupposition, that's a ridiculous presupposition. We are inundated and everything has become adversarial. I am not saying we stop that. I, th I think there are, but what, we, what I'm saying is, no, no, there, there are different needs being met in different ways and we delegate it. If we're gonna do, right, there's proper arenas for, for example, in science, I got a debate, that's part of the job. That's how you do it, that's how it works, right? But if I take, if I take that courtroom model into it, like try and take it into your relationship with your, your significant other, it's gonna destroy it. And you, yeah, exactly, <laughs> and, 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 and if you get into that protest polka, like Susan Johnson talks about, and this is a therapeutic point, you actually can't get to the differences because mm -hmm. people get caught up in the intensity of the conflict mm -hmm. and mistake that for the issue that is potentially resolvable. And what you have to do is you have to break out of that, you have to return people to a deep kind of potential for trust, and then you say, now let's talk about our differences and avoid the protest polka, right? And let's try and do, can we both, let's, 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 let's say, can we bring up the differences, and then is it possible for there to be mutual movement? I, I think some people who criticize me just also forget the fact that I'm Canadian, uh, uh, and, and right, and so that's just part of the culture. But for me, that would be my deepest reply. They're getting the cart before the horse, and they're they're presuming that there's a lack of adversarial debate in our culture, and I think that's not. And I think that, and it's funny because if you pay attention to the conversations, you'll realize that some of the d d differences between us are huge. They're deep. They're very, they're big and they're consequential if you follow them to what that means in terms of what types of uh, solutions you'll apply. And so, and, and, and so I don't, I think that, and we are aware of them. We're not pretending, and, but we're saying what, there's no point. We, we, we actually do, we, we, it's like a circle. Yeah. You, it's a, a circle is a good way to think about it. So we'll go into that subject a little, like we'll push it, we'll push it, we'll push it. We'll feel the tension, then we'll move on to something else. But then we know that in the next conversation we'll come back. Yeah. And so there'll be this circling where there's a mix of showing the person that you can trust them. And, and that it's like, this is not gonna break our relationship. We right. trust each right. other, but then knowing, okay, th th this isn't over yet. We have to come back and we're gonna discuss it. And so I think that the, 
you know, I think that a lot of what I'm seeing in this like critique sphere is like they what they would like is they would like to be able to put someone on trial yes. and then just kind of put out all the accusations and what do you say to that, sir? What do you say to this? I mean, that's fine, whatever. That can exist, but I think that that's definitely not a model for a society and it's not a model for showing how groups can exist. Because mm. if we think about it that way, we're saying one of the things we have is a breakdown in the existence of these intermediary groups. Like we, we don't have communities anymore. Our families are broken. We don't have, mm. uh, we don't have churches. We don't have intermediary yeah. organizations. Yes. We have the state and then we have the individual and everything else is being broken down in between. If we want to rebuild something like that, then we have to understand what it means. Because if you, it's the same. If you live in a group and you would take on that critical approach, someone that lives in the same house as you. How long do you think you're going to be living with them? Yes. It doesn't mean that you have to ignore it, but you have to come at it like this, like mm -hmm. the cycling of, 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 like the cycling of trust and of questioning. That's the only way to do it. And it's, in a relationship with a, one person, it's the same thing. You can't always be telling the person their faults. And those faults could be completely true. Like everything I say about my wife, if I criticize her, could be absolutely true. But if that's all I do, because I, well, you haven't fixed that yet, <laughs> right? Because I see you haven't fixed it, so let's keep talking about it until you fix it. It's like, that's not a real, that's not a real. It's also, it's also a pretentious standing point for the critic, right? So, right? Um, it's I'm out here and I'm going to do this and I'm going to find the criticisms. But where are you standing? Such are you going to come in and actually? One of two things will happen. Then you'll allow me to do that to you, and then we'll get to the point of non-negotiable faults that we won't right. And that and that's what happens when relationships break down. Or we'll get into I'm I'm going to actually open up a little towards you. You're going to, and then then you're going to move towards. Uh, I would argue, if you're going to actually participate, as opposed to taking a pretentious epistemic stance, then you're going to either move into acrimonious division, or you're going to have to move into something you know, yeah. like... like the but, but sometimes acrimonious division is necessary, of right? Course. It's absolutely necessary. Sometimes you do have to eject someone mm -hmm. from a group because their behavior or the things they're saying are completely corrosive to the existence of something. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying that that shouldn't exist, but we should be careful to think that this is that this is just the manner that we do deal with problems or, or questions, that we're not, that, that in our relationships we're not addressing these issues, we're doing it, we're doing it progressively through these cycles of discussion. So I don't, I, yeah, that's what I think. So here's what I would say, I totally agree with that. And what I would say is we have, eno we, we have enough forces, us, we have enough forces, both algorithmic and social, pushing into prominence acrimonious division, right, that we, like, we, it doesn't need to be emphasized. I'm not, it can be needed or necessary. I think we've got an imbalance. So if they think it's civility porn, um, I, I, I think it's trying to address a significant imbalance in the society. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously something I've thought a lot about having tracked a lot of these public conversations, one of which was the idea of the kind of intellectual dark web. Can we have sort of conversations that go beyond ideology that are kind of going somewhere new? And it's very difficult when there's a sort of level of prominence Partly, as you say, because of the tools, because of the algorithms, yeah. which on both sides sort of they they boost conflict, they boost tribalism, they boost criticism, but they also identify us often with our worst takes, or we become kind of we sort of calcify around our worst opinions in a way a yeah. lot of the time because we sort of are forced to defend them. And, and I also think there was a, as you mentioned, like the sense of safety that's needed to create for these conversations. I think was not created or was not able to be expanded beyond the sort of a, a small number of people and yeah. like what I think is quite beneficial about the conversation that, that we're part of is it's it's a it's hopefully happened a little bit more underground yeah. longer to be able to build up some of those relationships of trust not in this kind of like New York Times article about all of these new public intellectuals which then kind of creates this yeah. this obvious kind of target and quite rightly I mean it, it should have been a target but but then often people you saw that a lot of those relationships break down, a lot of the kind of safety of the conversation break down for various human reasons, magnified by the social media kind of platforms that we're using, which bring out the worst in us and augment uh, lack of trust as well. And I think a lot of it is, a lot of it is because it happened explicitly on the political level. And the political level, that is, that's what, the, that's what that level is for. It has, it does have a certain amount of debate, a certain amount of, of uh, you know, it's, it's the level of conflict. That's where the political level, that's, that's where we have wars. We have wars that's also where we get the attention as well. So it drags people there because there's such a temptation, because that's where you get the responses on Twitter, that's where you get the 
So, so in a way, it's, 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 a, it's a strange attractor of immense force. The, the discussion we've been having, they have political corollaries, but they're, they, they don't tend to be focused on politics. We don't tend to, to deal with the recent issue and everything. So we, we, we're trying to kind of talk about the meaning crisis more and about mm -hmm. how we can kind of solve that. Uh, and then sometimes we'll say a little bit of politics, but it's not the central thing. And I think that's helped. I think that in the IDW, one of the things that happened, and you can see what it broke down, was it ended up being the political sphere and like specific political questions that this person is on the wrong side of, or on the right side of, and then I can't associate with them anymore. And so then we criticize each other across and yeah, then so. Yeah, I agree with that. I have, uh, I think first the attempt to shift the sacred into the political arena has been a significant mistake. Um, I have criticisms that politics takes, uh, takes largely at the level of propositions and it can't incorporate a lot of the other stuff that I think is central to meaning making. Um, and I do worry also, like I said, um, I've said to you before, I worry about um, you know, the hermeneutics of suspicion being considered the default mode in, in which we approach reality. And the hermeneutics of suspicion uh, prioritizes uh, de devastating criticism. Right. So the, the, the devastating criticism that knocks the person down or reveals the secret flaw. I mean, aha! And it's like, okay, uh, you do need to do that because there are people that should be knocked off their high horse. I'm not saying that. But again, why not also present what the hermeneutics of, of suspicion always depends on, which is the hermeneutics of beauty, right? It's not the case. It, it, like, we maybe pull apart the, because oh. I think this is a great concept. We've, we've talked about it on the channel, but maybe people watching yeah, this sure. won't be so, familiar with it. So this is uh, an idea from Ricoeur, and the hermeneutics of suspicion is basically sort of given to the West by, you know, by Marx, by Freud, by Nietzsche. It's the idea that, you know, there's all, un underneath it, there's always a secret agenda, a hidden motive, Right, and, and, and you know, and there's a like lot, the unconscious or, or the unconscious, or the, or the class struggle, or the will to power, yeah. or, 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 or some systemic oppression, right? Uh, this is what you're doing, but this is what you're really doing. Yeah, yeah, the manifest and the latent Weber made a distinction too. Bureaucracies are set up to do this, this is their manifest function, but they have this latent function. So there's, a, you can see many thinkers coming to this. And, and the hermeneutics of suspicion is based on this idea that appearances are distracting, they're distorting, there's misleading, um, and um, what you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna break through. Now the problem, and this is a point that Merleau-Ponty hammers on and on again, right? Phenomenology of perception, and, uh, you know, uh, the visible and the invisible, and like, you can only realize something's an illusion in comparison to something else that you take to be real. And, what, what, and so what that means is there are, you have to say, no, no, there are situations, in, in order to say, that turned out to be illusion, I know that because, look, I can't touch it, right? And the touching mm -hmm. is real, right? And so what do you, what, what's going on when you say it's real? I, I'm not trying to do the metaphysics here. Uh, what you're saying is, no, no, there are times when the appearances aren't distracting or distorting or deceptive. They're actually disclosing of reality. And I take that to be at least the ancient. The aha moment. An aha moment. And I take that when, when appearances do that for us, um, that that's what the ancient, at least the ancient concept of beauty was. So the hermeneutics of beauty actually is primary. And the hermeneutics of suspicion is completely parasitic on it. And what I'm critiquing is the imbalance. Yeah. Right? I'm saying, no, 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 we should also be doing a lot to exemplify the hermeneutics of beauty for people because I want to, in, in, in that manner, I want to challenge the prioritization, the implicit and almost unchallenged, uncriticized assumption that the hermeneutics of suspicion is the way in which we should move through the world. And the, the idea that the hermeneutics of beauty are primary, this is, I mean, this is not just a statement that John is making, this is actually the manner in which you engage with your daily life every day, yes. all the time. Yes. When you walk out on the street and you don't think it's gonna break apart, when you pick up a glass and it's holding the liquid in it, yes. you are engaging in a hermeneutics of beauty. Trust. It's just trust. Yeah. It's just the idea that what is being disclosed to me, the, the appearance of it, is revealing what is true about it. And this is something which is, which is actually 
actually the fuel function, for your life. Exactly. You can function without it, and it is the fuel for everything that's good and that makes you feel alive. So although it is true that sometimes there are appearances can hide what is behind it. As John said, we have to remi remind people that the primary mode is this hermeneutics of beauty. And if you engage with it that way, and if you also, because one of the problems with the hermeneutics of suspicion is that if you engage others with that hermeneutics, the position in which you're in is a position from which you'll not, you won't receive anything from the person in front of you, because I already figured you out. I figured you out. And so it's like, you, you do these things, but I know what's really going on. Whereas if you engage someone with, a, with just, at first, I'm not saying it's not possible that John's lying to me, of course, but the first step is a yes, right? It's like, I come to you with a yes, and then we'll see later, but the first, and we do that all the time. When, when, when you're walking down the street, you don't think the person's gonna kill you, right? You, 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 you walk down the street and you engage with people in a manner that is always, that is generally this kind of, general basic trust and basic openness to, to what you're encountering. If you didn't have that, you'd be psycho. You'd just mm. be hiding in your basement and thinking everybody wants to kill you. Mm. I found your kind of riff on how many suspicion really powerful. We put out, I think, in the, the piece that we did just after, after Christmas, mm -hmm. the, the religious wars of the pandemic endgame. Yes, yeah. And as a, as a diagnosis of particularly where America feels like it is right now, Mm. where almost like the, the hermeneutics of suspicion is almost consuming itself. Yes. Like this sort of paranoid, conspiratorial yeah. yes. spiral downwards. But the fascinating thing is, as you point out, like behind this sort of conspiracy mindset is actually that addiction to the kind of like, aha, I figured yeah. it out. <laughs> yes. Like the, yeah. the addiction is actually to the to that kind of... Insight probably, porn. Probably, it's, yeah, it's, insight it's, porn. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's probably a kind of facsimile of true hermeneutics of beauty, but it's kind of an addiction to that facsimile of the hermeneutics right. of beauty, right. where you're like, I figured it out, and that, that's a kind of empowering thing, or, or feeds us in some way. It is, and, 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 and they, they, they look very similar. Uh, that's a statement from the hermeneutics of suspicion. Um, uh, they look very similar. Um, and, and so the, the, the thing you, you, you want to get at is, right, is, and, and I think this is also part of what's meant by beauty above and beyond the trust, the trust is important, is, the, the, is are these insights leading to reciprocal opening? Because you mentioned addiction, and I think that's completely legitimate. And Mark Lewis's idea of addiction as reciprocal narrowing between the agent and the arena. And are the insights, because you get this, you, you get what's called like a, you know, schizophrenic insight, when the schizo what actually gives the onset of schizophrenia is they have sort of an insight that makes sense of all the weird aberrant salience they're getting. Um, that's why just giving them drugs doesn't cure them because even though you can m m sort of dampen down their salience landscaping, they've created this huge insight-laden metaphysics that you then have to take apart with using completely different machinery, uh, therapy. So the question is, are, are the insights leading you like downward? Uh, or, or reciprocal narrowing, or are they opening you up? Are they doing reciprocal opening? And I think also part of what we mean by, be and this way, Plato puts beauty in with love, right? So if you and I do, this is Aaron's work, Aaron is the last name, if you and I do, if you do some, open, if you open up a bit to me, and I reciprocate by opening up, and then that gets mutually accelerating disclosure. Psy uh, psychologists have wonderful anemic names for things, right? Mutually accelerating disclosure. That's how you get people to fall in love. Not just romantic love, friendship love, right? That. And you see how that, that is exactly the opposite. It's an open system. Well, it, it, it's that the, the insights are, the insights, this is the Socratic point. The insights are not just ahas that way, they're ahas this way, right? So that you realize, you, you don't just, oh, now I'm figuring it all out. But is there within this, like, I'm, I'm seeing more and more of this, and I'm also realizing more and more of myself in a mutually affording fashion. And that, for me, if you can describe it one way, and you're talking about beauty, and you can describe it another way, and you're talking about the experience of love. And I think this is one of Plato's great insights about how those, those are just interwoven together. Um, and so the insight porn tends to go like this, where what people are doing is they're reinforcing and, and, they're, and they're making the insights are more and more about how this is confirming together. And, and, and why, that's, why that's so powerful for us is that's half of how truth works. So part of truth is, 
how things confirm. Think about, think about moments when you think something's really real. One is, oh look, everything fits together. That's why this was so real. But you also have these other moments is, holy cow, I didn't know that. And you think that makes that so real because it blows apart all my previous preconceptions and only something that's real could have done that, right? And, and beauty is doing both, but insight porn is only doing one. It's only doing the confirming cycle and locking you down and in. That's what I, we were talking last night and I said, you know, the thing with, with, with you, know, you know, when people get into conspirituality is the thing you notice is an absence of self-correction an absence of self-correction. There's continual confirmation, 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 confirmation. There's a relation here between curiosity. That curiosity is actually a sort of, I, I realized, it, it's something that, that I was taught in, in the Dialogos process, so I learned yeah. a type of Dialogos called inquiry. And one of the, the guides to it was always be curious. Be curious about your experience. Yeah. If you feel triggered by something, be curious about why that is. And actually that's a deceptively powerful tool because it's the openness. It avoids that sort of sense of like a closed system that then, yeah. that then kind of starts to spiral. But by nature, any closed system sort of entropy will, will kind of pull it downwards. Whereas curiosity always suggests like, I might not know. There might be something more to this. There is a, there's a it, it's by definition, it's an open system, especially if we're being curious about our reactions and how we're, how we're responding to things, as well as what might I not know. There's a kind of, there's a, it, it, it opens the system back up in some way. So I think that's good, and Kashtan has argued that a lot of what you get out of, a lot of the transformative benefit of mindfulness practices is actually curiosity. But here's a bit of pushback on it, <clears throat> because I, I think there, like, um, there's a good distinction uh, to be made between curiosity and wonder. Um, and I think Plato's very careful, you know, wisdom begins in wonder. Uh, so a way of thinking about it for me uh, we use the terms and they overlap, so I'm trying to stipulate a difference to make a conceptual distinction. I'm not saying that we all speak this way, that it, in real language it blurs, but I'm, I'm trying to make a conceptual distinction with two words. So I, I think of curiosity as within the having mode. Curiosity is I'm lacking something, there's a hole, and I'm going to find what fits in the hole. And that's why if you ask people, sort of without thinking about what they mean in, de in depth by curiosity, would you like curiosity be, to be, you know, to, to, to uh, persevere? Like you're, watch, you're reading a detective novel and you never find out who did it, right? Or, or you're, you're, watch, you're watching Lost and you realize there is no ending. There is no ending. <laughs> right, right. But, right, so that's one thing you can do. So I the curiosity is by definition time bounded, is that and, what and you're it's, saying? It's oriented towards having a solution to a problem. Yeah. Right? Whereas wonder, so Gabriel Marcel has this interesting this point. So, I, 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 like, you, I, you know, I talk about problem formulation, the way you frame a problem, right? And what you can do is you can frame a problem and then you can do an important act of self-correction. You can realize, oh no, the way I'm framing the problem is actually part of the problem. And then I step back and I try a more encompassing frame. And sometimes that's it, I solve my problem. But sometimes I go, oh wait, that frame is also, pro and I go like this, and I realize there's no place I can stand, that's my point against the, the crit critics earlier, there's no place I can stand on certain things where I can frame this. That's a mystery. And I think wonder is to put oneself into the momentum of mystery. And so it's very much about the being mode rather than the having mode. You're not trying to solve a problem, you're, you're trying to enter through mystery into the a right relationship about the depth of reality. And I think that's a fundamental. So I think what I would say, what you were actually talking about was wonder. And the reason, reason why that's important, it, it, it sounds, oh, what's the hair, academic. The reason is, is because curiosity is something that's very much loved by a kind of, you know, marketing and commodification and innovation and right and oh the, right oh so cur and 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 we can solve your curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And what we need to recover, and I think one of the proper jobs of both ancient philosophy and religion is to continually restore people to the capacity for wonder in the way I've just described it. I have a question for you in terms of this whole hermeneutics of suspicion. Yeah. And so 
I, first of all, I, I, of course I totally agree with the idea that we need to recover this sense of wonder. We need to recover this open sense. But I'm wondering if you ever thought about how, as the hermeneutics of suspicion were set up, let's say in the 19th century, early 20th century, that it actually created a, a system of hermeneutics of suspicion which grew yes. and was instru instrumentalized. So a, a, an exa a simple example is right, Freud engages in, in, in brings about hermeneutics of suspicion, his nephew Edward Bernays writes propaganda, yeah. Yeah. goes into advertisement, and now we are flooded with messaging that is involved completely in hermeneutics of suspicion all the time. Yes. The message is telling me you'll be young and happy and beautiful, and what it's saying is buy this toothpaste or whatever. And so, so, there, so it's as if it actually is justifying people's hermeneutics of suspicion. Advertising is the best example uh, yeah. because we are constantly surrounded by it. I mean, even the social media thing is the same, right? They're saying, come here, network, everybody will be together, and you realize that, no, we just want to trap your attention so that you can look at advertisement. And, and it's like, so, so it's hermeneutics so, of suspicion all the way down. Exactly, so, so I think that, so I think that, I think it's mostly because I want to, I want to express some compassion for people who, who enter into that because yes. it's there yes. and it's and it's not only there and let's say Bernays not only brought it into into advertisement he was also uh, hired by the U.S. government yes. in order to message and in order to create PR and public relations messaging, which is also engaged in explicit hermeneutics of suspicion. Mm -hmm. So it's like we, on the one hand, we, we say, okay, we want people to break out of it and we want people to be able to engage the world with wonder and, oh. and that, but, but that the reality is that, yeah, your governments are lying to you and the advertisers are lying to you and the social media people are lying to you. and. And you can okay. see it, and you can see it, and you feel like there's no escape. So I can understand why someone would make that their entire worldview. I, I think that's a completely legitimate point. And, and, and um, first of all, if, if I was not conveying proper compassion, I should have. Uh, that's okay. No, no, no. I mean, the, the virtues, virtues, um, virtues matter. Uh, uh, and um, so I think that's well said. Um, this is, uh, that always bothered me in the Matrix movies. Uh, Oh, they're part of the system, so you can kill them. And it's like, really? <laughs> like, really? <laughs> wow. I don't. Are, are you guys really the heroes? <laughs> oh, we can kill. They're part of the system, so we can kill them. And it's like, whoa. And that part. And that's the unwilling part of the system. Yes, exactly, exactly. So that I always had, like, like I always had a visceral, like, oh, that's the really radically insufficient justification. Yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, I think that what you said is. Well placed, and I think, and I think this this gets us into something uh, uh, quite nuanced, which is like, and and uh, and the, the work I'm doing with Christopher Massipietro is we prepare the series on Socrates and Kierkegaard, like, and, and Kierkegaard wrote his thesis on Socratic irony, and, and Kierkegaard is uh, is cult, like all about irony, but the problem is again the hermeneutics of suspicion has taken irony and basically made it sort of equivalent to cynicism. Right, where I irony is a kind of serious play that is supposed to do exactly what you're talking about. Then you see both Socrates um, and Kierkegaard wrestling with it. I take it that Kierkegaard sees this in Christ, but I, I'll leave that to you if you think that's a legitimate thing. Right, which is, I'm going to speak to you in such a way, right, that's going to always be almost like Tai Chi, always trying to move around the hermeneutic. I'm not going to try and hit you. In the hermetic system, I'm going to try and find a way to insinuate and weave my way in without participating in the hermetic suspicion. That's you've got to maintain Socratic uh, integrity. And so, the 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 there's there's there there. And this is clearly in Kierkegaard. There's a loving irony. And I think it's also in Socrates. Socrates says he loves the people he's talking to. Um, and and I, and I imagine because I, I I see Kierkegaard wrestling with this as a also with, um, how do you talk to somebody in sin? Because you know, right, he says there's a parallel thing, because uh, people are locked into a pattern. He's, he's being like a, a very uh, Augustine. People are locked into a self-deceptive, self-destructive pattern. And whenever, anything you do to try and do that will just get uh, co-opted into the system. It's like the parasitic processing stuff I talk about. So for me, um, this, this is again why dialogos. Dialogos is to give up the manipulative thing, but to say, well, when I'm talking to people, especially people who are in that, can I exercise that kind of loving irony, that Socratic irony, 
and, and make it very distinct from what passes for irony today as a way of trying to um, well, draw them out into the hermeneutics of beauty rather than to, to just criticize them or just attack them for, um, for being in the hermeneutics of suspi uh, suspicion. I guess where I get a little bit more directly confrontational and critical is people who are, uh, are uh, sort of have some relatively deep understanding of the, what we're talking about here and actively choose to directly um, you know, use it to manipulate other people. There's, yeah. a different, there's a difference between people who, as you said, are unwitting victims, if I can put it that way, of something, and then people who are bad players, yeah. right? Um, and so I would try and be, have that proper kind of irony. And, and you see, irony requires a very sophisticated kind of self-awareness, right? Um, uh, towards people who are victims, uh, but be much more confrontational. And this is what I see in the, in the life of Socrates. So Socrates confronts the people who are just the tyrants and just, right? But he will do this other thing with people who are uh, caught up. And yeah, they're just caught up in this mental game that they don't realize or this mental sphere that they can't see the mechanisms of trying to kind of tease it out so people can see it. So Bob Newhart once had a very funny routine where the, 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 the really bad therapist mm -hmm. and the person goes in and, and says all of their problems and, uh, and then Bob, Bob Newhart, as only Bob Newhart could do, he'd say, okay, so this is your problem, right? And this is your problem, this is your problem? Yeah, stop it! Yeah. Stop doing it! <laughs> right? And it's like, and it's great, and we know, and we laugh because we know that's absurd, yeah. right? And, and that, by the way, that joke by Bob Newhart is an example of the kind of irony I'm talking about. Yeah, and you can see it. You can see that all the time now, which is, which is so an example you're seeing in the, in the political discourse that I see all the time. They're saying something. They say they like, "Oh, he's far right," and what they mean by that is not clear. They mean like you shouldn't talk to them. You, you yeah. shouldn't ever engage with them. You should act, either act as if they don't exist, or you should just tell them to stop being in the far right, or I won't talk to you. And that and it's like that. It's not how reality works. Like you can't. That, that that's not. A, we have to. We have to be able to engage in conversation, be able to, to, to keep our distances, make sure people understand the differences. But the idea of saying just stop having that political opinion, right? That's basically on Twitter is basically all that it is. Like, yeah. this person is stupid for having this political opinion, they should stop it. That's not, we're not gonna get anywhere. And here's, here's. here's. But, but the way Bob Newar does it is to, put, like, to call attention to that, and yes. just how absurd it is, yeah, of course. But, but the thing is, and, and here's where you can do that kind of irony, that overemphasis on the product of cognition and an underemphasis on the process and an undervaluing of the process is actually the hallmark feature of irrationality. If I had to say in one thing what makes people irrational is that they focus, they fixate on the product of their cognition and they see no value in paying careful attention to the process. How they're collapsing into yes. binary so, thinking or whatever. Tell me what you think, because I maybe because what you're saying is making me realize let's say one of the things that I'm doing, or because because I'm realizing that one of the things that I'm doing is I'm trying to help people see that because one of the problems of this weird moment is that people see patterns. Yes. But they always see them, they see them as leading towards this hermeneutic of suspicion. Like yes. it's hiding something yes. and I can see behind it the true intention. Whereas what I'm trying to do is to say, here are these patterns and they point towards uh, this beautiful music basically. That's like, why what like, you're doing is yeah. so important. So it's like, here's this, here's this pattern of reality and, and here how it's musical and beautiful and will lift you up basically. And so That's exactly it. So uh, yeah, this is what I mean about how radical you are, right? Like the way, so you, well, I, it seems to me that you, right, are trying to move to what, the way I just described it, a, a deeply ironic understanding of symbolism. What I mean by that, let me be very careful, is a symbol is something that has this very powerful property, right? And you are very clear, a symbol is not just a metaphor. It's not just the transpositions between propositions. And you say, no, no, this is what you mean, I think, by it happens, right? It, it's, it's a way of getting your cognition coupled to how reality is unfolding, if I understand you. Yeah. Is, that, is that fair? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so you're in this frame, and you're locked in, and a symbol, right, has the capacity to be taken into the frame 
but also not belong and take people out, which is the proper step. This is why Kierkegaard writes under pseudonyms. Mm. It's the same thing. Mm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to present something to you that you're going to be initially, because if people don't take the symbol into the frame, it won't do a damn thing, yeah. right? So I'm going to make the symbol at least attractive to you, and it, it, right? But from your frame, but once you get into it, once it gets inside, it'll break things apart and it'll attract you outside your frame. It'll reverse the arrow of relevance. That's what I see you doing with symbolism. Yeah, well that's why I do movie interpretations, because I find movie interpretations are pretty low on the hierarchy of things that are important. But what I realize is that, okay, so the people love these movies and they get enthralled by them and they, yes, they don't yes. know what's going on. So it's like, let me go in there, let me show you something, and then let me show you how it points towards something more than just the, the pleasure of the narrative, you could say. Yes, and then see, this is, the, and this is I've been, I was deeply in, influenced by Sally McFagg's work on, she's a Christian theologian, on parables. Because I think, you know, the, the same way in which people trivialize symbols into metaphor, yeah. I think people often trivialize parables into allegories. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, and, and so when I was reading other things, like Plato's parable of the cave, or the Sufi stories, or some of Kierkegaard's, like Kierkegaard has this great parable. I, I love it, right? And you get his humor and the irony. So there's this bunch of geese, and they walk into this beautiful building, and they sing and sing about flying, and then they walk out again. And you get it, you get it, oh, right, right, and all these things opens up, right, right? right? And, but if you look at something more profound, right, like let's say the parable of the prodigal son, your initial, this is how I, I continue, and Carol Shields, like I, people writing about it, right? I, keep, I keep experiencing it. I, I get taken into the parable, different roles. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes I'm the prodigal son, sometimes I'm the father, sometimes I'm the elder son. Yeah. And I realize, oh wait, if I try to resolve this and remove, uh, make it a stable, finished narrative, I've lost what it does. What it does is it draws me in and then it blows me apart. And then when I started reading Jesus' parables that way, it was like, oh wow, right, right? Because I was brought up like, no, it's an allegory. He's talking about these are the Jews and these are the right, right, right. And the, but it's, if you reread, it's a defined system. yeah, it's a defined thing. Yeah. But it, but if you do the if you do this thing, right? Sorry, this is long, but this is this is. I'm trying to really articulate what I see in your work, and I, I hope you're appreciating it that way. Like the, the, that, like I mean this as a compliment. You're Christ-like in that way. What you're doing, okay? You are trying to get people to see. In, a, in this way that is like the parables, right, in which it, it seems so familiar and so attractive and then you take it in and then you explode it from the inside and instead of how is this relevant to my frame, it breaks you out and means how am I going to become relevant to this bigger frame that I've just been exposed to. That's what I see you doing. And I see that as much more fundamental, sorry I'm being a little bit strident here, but I see that as much more fundamental that's the wrong word for me to use. But I see that as more of a fundamental to Christianity right. than a lot of the sort of statements of particular propositions. That about, because that's, that's what I see when I'm reading the Gospels and Jesus, at least one of the things I see. I'm not, I, 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 yeah. I'm not denying, in fact, there's ways in which you can interpret the incarnation and other things along what I've just said. But that, that's, what, that's what I think you're doing with the symbolism that's so different than I've read a lot of books on symbolism, right? Oh, the symbol is this, and the symbol is that, and oh no, it's a, it's a way in which the conscious mind can deal with the unconscious, and, and that's right, but you know, right, they all share this much larger pattern. Do Jung's conscious and unconscious. A symbol is how something from the unconscious can get into the conscious mind that blows up the ego structure and opens it up to the unconscious. It's the same thing over and over again. And I think you have seen that. And you haven't just seen it, you're enacting it and you're reducing it in other people. So it's sort of taking it from a propositional level to a participatory and, 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 experience. And, 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 and also reciprocal opening. It's opening people up at that deeper level. That's what I see. That's what I see. And I, and I see you doing that. In, I, I, I really, I really intend this as a compliment. Yeah, I, I, I definitely take it as, as a, too big of a compliment. For sure, the Christ-like thing we can set aside. <laughs> but I think, I think you're, I think you, you, I think you're right. I think that that's that's definitely what I'm, what I'm trying to do. Like, Good. I, 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 I'm definitely trying to change the way people see. I always, it's funny because I actually think that 
it's like I'm not a Buddhist, but I, I, I think that I'm doing, I'm always trying to do something like a Zen Cohen. That's what I'm trying to do. Exactly. I'm trying to like yeah. bring some, say, like say, yeah. there's some, here's something familiar, and here's how you have no idea, and like, but not in a way that will make, not in the hermeneutics of suspicion way. Yes. In a way that brings you in and deeper and more and reality. That, yeah. Right? Open to people. That's what, that's what I hope. Exactly. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. I think, I think a parable is to narrative what a koan is to a question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I tend to, I definitely agree with that. And, the, and, 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 you, and then, and, and, uh, and those two are what aporia is within the Socratic practice, when you bring people to aporia. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Hmm. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm happy that, I mean, it's like, it's really surprising to hear you say that just because it's, it's one of those things where, how can I say this? It's one of the things that I don't formulate explicitly, or that I keep. It's like my that's my secret. Yeah. So so no, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. But it's true that 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 I think that that's what, at least that's the method. I think symbolism can do a lot more. But I know that that's the method that I use. And I'm always when I'm talking about symbolism, I'm always thinking that way. Like, yeah. how can I get in? and then t say something that at first either, sometimes it's something you don't understand at all at first, yeah. and then you're surprised to find you understand it, or something you thought you understood, and then I can just re peel off a layer, and then, and then you have that aha. Uh -huh. And that for me, that's the, that, that's, a, that's, that's, the, that's the core of the Socratic practice, the mm -hmm. same thing. That's what I see Socrates doing again and again. And well, I, that's what I, it's funny, like now it's, it's all these things rolling in, because I, I do think that insight because you talk about this too, like this yeah. idea of a cascading insight or that yeah. insights, and I think that it is the it is for at least online and in terms of communication, it is the the fastest way to participation. Yes. Right. Because everybody has access to it all the time. Like it's it's actually just there in front of you. It's yes. like right behind the, that first veil. And so if you're able to just get someone to have insight, it's like all of a sudden that light that goes on, it's not a change of information, it's yeah. not a propositional change of opinion, none of that is going on. It's actually, it, it is, the best way to say it is that there's a light that goes on and then that light wants to shine. And you then it's like, okay, now, I look at the world and the world has changed. So the way that I see the world is not the same as it was. And sometimes you can't hold on to it for a very long time. Sometimes it just lasts a yeah. few seconds because I know it. Because when I have insights, the same, I have these insights, and then it's like, oh, no, no, no. It's like, and then it just kind of gets away. But it's like if, if people can have those little moments, then I think that. I think that that's one of the ways to help them get back on a path of meaning and to get back into, yeah. I agree. I, again, if it's if it's the right kind of insight. Yeah. Right. Well, the type of insight that, like you said, that yes. transforms you, that doesn't just give you the idea that it's like, I figured out yes. how this thing works. It's, it's an insight of wonder rather than an insight of curiosity. Go. That's a great way to say it. No, yes. that's, a, that's perfect. Thank you. Because you were talking about that yeah. just before, and I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, that it all comes together that way. Yeah, yeah. It's one without kind of resolution. Yeah, it's it's or without it, resolved state, but one that kind of is but it about opens expanding. Up. It's like and a resolved state that opens itself up. It's like when you're falling in love with somebody. You mm -hmm. fall in love, and that takes you into them in a way that affords you to fall deeper in love. That affords you to fall deeper in love. Mm -hmm. That's why I sometimes say my whole project could, could be put into the sentence: I want to help people fall in love with being again. Mm -hmm. And the human of suspicion prevents that from happening. Again, it has its place. We don't, we, uh, this is a, the politeness in me. I don't think we ever, like, well, maybe, because well, there's a bit of Augustine here too, but right now, I think a lot of the time, a lot of the time, people don't pursue something knowing that it's wrong or evil. Pursue something, they, 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 they believe it to be, to be good. Uh, another way of putting it is, I think people often fail not because they're pursuing something good, but because they pursue a lesser good at expense of a greater good. That's what I mean when I, I tweeted once. I, 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 I don't tweet very much, but I'll periodically tweet these sort of, I try to be like, uh, you know, Epictetus. You know, these little sort of provocative things to try and get people talking. And that's what I meant when I said, I think sin is the failure to love wisely. And I wanted to get that in as something that overlaps, but it's not the same as our notion of immorality. Yeah, and that's what Dante 
yes. treats completely yes. in yes. his comedia. Like yes. that's the yes. way he sees sin is exactly that. It's always love that's driving. Yes. But it's love that is misplaced, it's excessive, or that's too cold, or that it's just not it's not proper love. It's not the love that at its right level. So one of the things I'm seeing in, in as I go through Dionysus, uh, Dionysus is somebody I don't just read, I did Lexio Divina on Dionysus. Um, and, and he there's this um, and this was in a conversation we had yesterday with Jordan, but the, there, there's, you know, there's the proportioning of attention. The proper proportioning of attention is one of the virtuosities and virtues of love. It, when you're loving well, you are properly, when you love things well, you are properly proportioning your attention. This is Eric Murdoch's notion uh, in The Sovereignty of the Good, that the, 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 the Dispensing your attention appropriately as things are deserve yeah. is, is, the, is the actual key uh, to, to, to being a good person. I gave a talk two months ago at Turkintor College about Dante and, and hierarchies of love. Exactly yeah. this. And how Dante structures his whole, it's, it's really beautiful because he, he sets it up in a personal way. And you can see it that, so you, you have this sense, right? Because what there's a place in, in the purgatory where he asks, he, he uh, yeah, I'm reading it right now. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, so he, he asks, why is it my brain? That he, well, who's this guy, the Aeneid guy? The, Virgil. Virgil, sorry, yeah. man alive. So he asks Virgil, basically, like, why did you come see me? Yeah. Why did you come get me where I was in this dark place? And he says, well, there's this woman who came down, yeah. and she was, and, and she said, why don't you go see Dante? And it was Beatrice. Yes. So Beatrice, but then Beatrice heard from Dante's patron saint. And then it says that, and there was another lady. And so he's basically suggesting that the virgin yes. called upon his patron saint. Yeah. And his patron saint called upon, uh, on, on, uh, called upon uh, Beatrice, and then Beatrice called upon Virgil, and then he came. But then you can see it reverse now, yes. where you can see it as Dante's hierarchy of love it, it, it itself, yes. Yes. which is that it's poetry and it's the, it's the poetic spirit which made Dante possible that he could know what love is. And then Beatrice is what awakened love in him. Yes. But then that love was never sufficient. And then the higher beings up to into the Virgin yeah. ends up being this like ascent, the very ascent that he's doing from hell all yes. the way to heaven yes. is an ascent of hierarchies of love. And, and so it's like as if the, the very way in which the people that come see him represent in his own life what those hierarchies of loves are, that they're all good, right? That the love for poetry is good, but everybody knows, right, the, the stuffy professor who like reads poetry, but <laughs> can, he is completely asocial and can't have relationships. And so, but you all, and you know the person who is in love with a, a person, but becomes so obsessed with that person that they lose themselves in their relationship, right? So you know that all these loves kind of stack up. And I just find it so powerful to realize how powerfully he kind of, and, and then when he goes up, it's not exactly the same, but he goes to Bernard of Clairvaux, who is like the yeah. theorician of love in, in the Middle Ages, then ultimately into the Virgin as this ultimate image, and ultimately into the, obviously into the, you know, into the non-duality of God, God right, himself. Right, so, right, right. Yeah. so anyway, so I, I just think that it's a great place to look for that, because it, it's that, I think the whole comedia is organized that way. And, and, um, and that, and this isn't an insult to Dante, I think he would like it. That, that structure is actually given, that's the structure given in the symposium, right, about, uh, and, 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 it, and, it, and it, one of the things that's uh, a little bit clearer, you don't get it as so much in the purgatory, and I'm only in the purgatory, I, I, I know people tell me, you get this, what I'm going to talk about in a second, you get it more clearly when he moves, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm still in the inferno, but when yeah. you move out of the purgatory into uh, Paradiso, but in, in Plato, each love, Right, and, and this is this is what I wanted something to ask you about because you you made, you made a statement of faith that lines up with this, I think, mm -hmm. right? So Plato says each level of love sort of scaffolds you unto the next level. Yeah. So first you love beautiful bodies, and then you start to love right beautiful character, and then you start and this is he says this you start to love beautiful institutions, mm -hmm. distributed cognition, and then you start to love sort of you know, beautiful aspects of sort of fundamental reality, and then you love beauty itself, right? And, and, and each one affords and scaffolds the other. And then I was thinking about this in connection to what you said. I forget who you were talking to. Was it, was it Brett Weinstein? Uh, wait, you, you, yes, it was. And you were, try, you were talking about this the other day. You're trying to give him a notion of faith that's orthogonal 
to what we've inherited from the Enlightenment and perhaps from the darker parts of the Reformation, which is faith is to assert things without evidence, like, right, which is, I, I, I don't know why anybody would want that. Um, but, um, but you were saying, and if I, if I get you wrong, please correct me, but you were saying, no, no, faith is this, you're at this level and you love it, but there's something in it that that love also draws you to something right. higher and, you, and then you, you, you get to a gestalt that, right, you can't infer from the lower level, but once you're there, and this is the Kierkegaardian leap too, I think. And it's like a call. You can it's feel it like a call, yes. and, and that's what is the call. It is a, it's a call to faith, I guess. And right, and, but, and, and Plato, but Plato has that love is always metaxu. Love is always a call, right? Love is always a call beyond what, what is. Uh, and so, it seems, so you, this is what I'm trying to understand what you said. You're at this level, love is being instantiated, embodied, incarnated, yeah. whatever word you want, um, there, and, and, that, and that is a good, but then the love also issues a call because eros is always in between the, uh, the, the, the human and the divine, that's right? And then if you follow the call, if you, if you are willing to fall in love, you fall upwards into a gestalt that then makes sense of the lower level, but, and, and so you can always, in reverse, justify having taken the leap, but you can never justify before you take the leap. If, yeah. Am I understanding no, you correctly? I, I totally, I totally, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, when you talk about, it's funny that you talk about the symposium, because I think that in the symposium, there's, it's hap all this is happening in multiple levels, and yeah. that the scene with Alcibiades and Socrates, yes. that's, the, that's like yeah. the, the best, it's like the best scene, because Alcibiades is trying to seduce Socrates, and Socrates is trying to like basically engage with him enough so that his desire remains active, See, and then yeah. lift his desire up towards something that's more. The, that's like what I mean by this Socra the, the symbolic irony. Yeah. That's the Socratic thing at the same time. Please continue. And and it's in, what, what's interesting is that if you know the story of Athens, you know that Alcibiades. It's as if it's all you get the sense that if Alcibiades had just followed Socrates up, he would not have betrayed he, Athens. Yes. Right? And, and the I, idea that yes. Socrates is guilty of perverting you know the youth it's in the symposium is kind of overturned because you see that no Socrates is actually trying to bring Alcibiades out of his own glorious like yeah. kind of self-love of bodies yeah. and move into something more and that if he had only been able to then the Alcibiades would not have Athens would not have been betrayed what and what do you think of that moment that it's, it's almost a moment of mystery because Alcibiades sees it yeah he hears the call right he gets it like that's clear in Plato, and yet he nevertheless turns away. And he even he admires yes. he admires Socrates, but he's like, no, it's not for me. Or like this is, you know, he's too he's too he might be too glorious. Yes. Like that's one of the problems. It's one, I guess it's also one of the problems of pride. It's like if that's the problem of not being able to rise up to the next level is pride, because mm -hmm. pride appears as self sufficiency. It appears as self naming. Oh, yes. And so it's like I've got it. And, 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 I, and I master this, and I see myself as the pinnacle of something. So it's, it's a lot harder to jump up the next level. When you master one level, let's say, not that you master it too much, but that you take it as self-sufficient, and then you, and it's hard to go up. Mm -hmm. So that's why humility is always part of this process. Yeah, it has to. Right. So the idea is that you, you, humility makes it possible for the call to like lift you up. I, I think humility and wonder, because wonder always gets you to to challenge the self-sufficiency of any framing yeah. that you're in. Yeah, but because it's actually the, the, the lower level is impossible of being resolved at that level. Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea that you master it in that level, it has to be pride, because it cannot be resolved. It has to, it, in order for it to be resolved, it has to reach the Gestalt. Say more what you mean, but I, I think I understand what you mean. By right, so, okay, so, 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 yeah, I'm trying to find the best example. Like, I'm, am, am I going for an object or for a, a human process? Right, let's, go for an, let's go for an object. It's like the, the, the gestalt of the glass cannot be resolved by the different elements of the glass. Yes. Right. And so, if one element of the glass or some aspect of a, of of the of one level thinks that it masters everything, that it's got it, that it completely owns this thing, yeah. it's lying. It doesn't. It. It's not possible. Right. And so, can I try something? Yeah. Again? Go for it. Go for it. Okay. So, and again, we were talking about this yesterday, but I think it's completely appropriate. So I've been trying to get to a way of making phenomenologically viable and powerful the platonic notion of the form, because it seems like it, it's been turned into this abstract thing. And so there's this idea that 
right? And, 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 and I'm trying, and other people are doing this, not just me. John Rusin is doing an amazing job, having a huge influence on me. Uh, but the idea that, and this is from Marlo Ponti, we never actually see something, right? Because we, we, we can't see all of its aspects. The, and, and, and beyond the perceptible aspects, there's conceptual, there's imaginal aspects, right? You know, this could be used as a hat, right? Yeah. Oh, well, well, right, right, all that. So there's all these, this is multi aspectuality and yet it's not, it's not a cacophony. It's, it's harmony, it's like, a, it's like a melody of music. There's a through line that runs through all the aspects. And, and, and the through line, and this is where Marlo Ponti, I think, is better than Husserl, because Husserl thinks he can find the essence as a, complete, as a completion or something like that, the reduction. I, I don't want to get into the scholastic arguments about that, but Marlo Ponti says, no, 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 this, this is inexhaustible. Right? The through line is, is, right, it's like Tolkien, Ilvatar, you know, sings, yeah. right, the, the, the song of reality. So that through line is not itself an aspect, right? It's yeah. not because it's that which can bind all possible aspects together. Exactly. Right. So that's what it's, why it's a form and not something you see, although the word eidos actually means the look of something. Yeah. It means a particular aspect. So he's trying to say, he's trying to play with aspectuality, and then of course you increase that when you do dialogos, because then you get multiple perspectives, each with multiple aspectuality, yeah. right? And it gets layered in this, and what's the form going through all of that? And, and it's wonderful, right? But what I was going to say is, right, is the lower level, what you, what, what you like, when, when any aspect thinks it captures the through line and thereby enters into a kind of profound category mistake yeah. because no aspect can be the through line. Is that what you're That's exactly what I'm saying. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. That's a, and that's what, you could say that that's what, that's pride. That's, you want to say pride before the fall. Like, right. that, that's, what, that's what pride is. And that is, you could say, the, that's the origin of sin. That's when you miss the mark, mm. right? Because the mark is, is beyond. The mark is the through line. Yeah, and so yeah. You, if, you, if you think that you've got it here, yeah, then you, you've missed it. You, you're not aiming. Yeah. You're not aiming properly. It has to move up a, across the categories, across the level, to enter into this gestalt. But the gestalt does, so, like, because I, 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 me, it's just stories, right, in my mind. So, yeah. so the gestalt in the stories, it always appears at this level. Yeah. But if you see it in the stories, what it'll appear as is always something like a glimmer or like a seed or like a a golden something, a golden ball, a golden, yeah. a golden, uh, like a little thing, a small, like when Christ said, Christ, 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 Christ talked about it, he said, the smallest thing, the seed, the, the mustard, smallest, the mustard yes. seed, you yeah. can't see it, it, it has no substantiality, right? So it, it has to do with the, and even has to do with the idea, in a way, of the geometric point, right? The idea of the, 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 the in a space, the, the, the geometric center of a, of a circle has no position in the circle. It doesn't hold, it doesn't have, Yes, yes. Space, it, it, but it, it's there. Yeah, Nicholas. So it appears as this yeah. glimmer, as this, this thing. Okay. So that brings me to then, wow, I want to join two things we've been talking about. Okay, it seems to me that glimmer is, right, like you said, there's somehow in which the gestalt is glimmering, shining yeah. into the lower level, right? And that is, if, if that, to me, that lines up with what we were saying earlier about what the symbol is. Yeah. And that so there's a relationship between faith and the ability to see symbolically. I think so. Because you can't, I, I think, no, I think you're right. And that's why I frame it that way, because it's like the, the symbol, the gathering, the manner in which the pattern gathers into this unity, it's like that, it kind of pulls you out. Yes. And it pulls you up, you yes. could say. Because it also, because the, some, if you can able, if you're able to help people see the, okay, actually, okay, think about this. So be able to, if you're able to help people see a pattern is something and help them see that it, there's a pattern, the through line, yeah. and then you can help them see like that pattern can be applied to something which is not at all in this category. Yes. Then it pulls them out. It has to. Yes. Right, so it's like, the, here's a, the, you could think of it like, you know, here's a pattern of being, here's a pattern of action. We call this pattern, you know, affection. And so you can see, it's like it's a bunch of things, right? It's, it's a tap on the shoulder, it's like, what is this? It's a like kiss on the cheek, like what are these things that we're touching each other? Yeah. Like what is that? But no, but you see that there's a pattern going through, and this pattern has a, has a reality, it's effective. If I can help you see the pattern, then I'm pulling you up, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, Oh, that's affection. That's affection. That's affection. And of course, it's it's organic. It's messy. Sometimes you can it can slip or whatever. But I think that there's something about that. Okay. So, uh, okay. Good. So, 
so we've got faith and symbolism, but we also linked symbolism and love, and we, li we linked love and beauty. Are they all linked together? Is there an aspect of faith that is responding to a call of beauty from a higher level? I think that's what it is. I think, but that's what, I think that that's what beauty is. I mean, beauty, beauty is, you could say something, but it, beauty is the integration. Yes. It's the integration of the higher and the lower aspects together, because it's something like, I see the pattern, and I see the, I see the, not the messiness, but I see the... Uh, yes, Spinoza does this with scientia, yeah. scientia intuitiva. And, and, and when you get scientia intuitiva, like when you, when you see spinozistically and you get, okay. you enact scientia intuitiva, then you get the ethics. The ethics is this long argument, complex, mind-breaking thing, right? And, and if you read uh, elsewhere in Spinoza, he's actually quite capable of writing sort of lyrically and beautifully, but he's doing this thing. And then you get this, and, I, and, and you get it. And, and I, it's only because I think I had experience in mindfulness with Prajna. You see the whole of the argument in each premise, and you see how each premise goes into the whole of the argument. So I think the best way to say it is you see, you see the embodied pattern, and it, you see it as embodied. So you see a beautiful woman, you see the balance, and you see the, you see the, 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 the structure, but then you also see that little difference Right, that, yes. that you see yes. that little yes. difference, that little idiosyncrasy which but is the floating around. Embodies the person in a exactly. powerful way. But yeah. I think that that's what that's the that's that's beauty. I think that that's what beauty. But, but so, but that seems then, as I said, that seems that there's there's something in faith that is bound up with beauty, as opposed to being bound up with assertion. I think so. No, I I, I think so. And oh. I don't. I mean, I never seen. I mean, maybe never, but at least for 20 years, I've never seen faith as bound up with assertions anyways. Like, I don't think that it's a, I mean, I, I say that, okay, I'm, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, because I do say the creed, like I will yeah. say the creed, yes. and I do believe that there's something important about, about the assertion, uh, but I, I do think that the creed is also there, the, let's say the creed is a good example. The creed is a gathering of elements of Christianity into a through line. Yeah. It's like, it's like oh, here's all these things Christians have said, all these things that are in the Bible or whatever, we, we're going to condense them, we're going to bring them together, but we also understand that this is there to point to something which is ineffable and is a, is a mystery. There's all, you mentioned faith and beauty. Yeah. There's all, so there's kind of an aesthetic sense to faith. Yeah. Or but, it's deeply entwined with that aesthetic. Yeah, there's an aesthetics to it, uh, but I want to do, uh, like, I, I want to, I want to, I, I, uh, the, these two conversations are like growing together in my mind, the one we had yesterday and the one, uh, but, See, see, with Kant and the three critiques, and this is, a, 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 I think, a central point that Habermas made, we, we separated the true, the good, and the beautiful. We separated them into autonomous regions. Um, and, 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 and because the, the ultimate sacredness in the Enlightenment is autonomy. Um, and, and, you know, autonomous reason is Kant. But anyways, um, and, and I think that is one of the besetting things uh, of the meaning crisis. Because them being... Uh, uh, trying to separate the true, the good, and the beautiful from each other. They're not identical, but I, I, I do think the ancient, Thomas Aquinas puts them as they're, they're convertible to each other. They interpenetrate and mutually afford each other. So I want to use aesthetics in an ancient sense, not the way we mean it now. I want to mean in a sense of an attraction to beauty that's also a falling in love with reality, right? That is also the transformation of one's uh, being connected in, being in right relationships. The right relationship is goodness, right? The disclosing of reality is a kind of deep kind of truth. Uh, and then the falling in love with it is the, they're all bound up together inseparably. That's how I would. I because would put it. Kant's, let's say the way that Kant brought about aesthetics, would you agree that this might be controversial a little, but do you agree that without him wanting this, that Kant's notion of pure aesthetic or this aesthetic experience is what led to something like entertainment? culture because he he did, he has this notion of so it's like that you're going into a museum and looking at a piece of art like there's nothing wrong with that I do it I do it yeah. too but there's a difference between that and let's say the function that an icon will play where the icon will be beautiful right the icon will have all the elements of beauty that you'll find in a painting in a museum but it's a it's the calling of the person that's representing it's that person is represented for a reason yeah. and that person is calling you into engagement into relationship in a frame where it, everything is calling you into this mystery and so so the, the let's say the, the way that i stand in front of an icon is one which pulls me into all these corollaries 
that is engaging me with, also with even my own sins, you would say. It's like, yeah. I look at this saint as an example of virtue, and it's like, I, now I realize I need to transform my, this aspect of myself or whatever. But if I stand in front of Picasso, I can get like a, it's like, this is, it's an interesting, beautiful experience. It's an emotional experience, maybe. Maybe there's a message there. That's not the same. It's not the same as entering into like a church and having this architecture that surrounds you and like yeah. drags, draws you in. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, that's hard. I, I read a really good book by Fisher called uh, something like Wonder and the Aesthetics of Rare Experience where he's, he's talking about how Kant started the emphasis, well, he's not the sole person, but he starts the emphasis on the sublime and the sublime is that sense of, right, reason is running but it can't sort of come to a conclusion and that's sort of, sort of open-ended um, and that and then what Fisher said is, is that has tended to exclude it, it tend to exclude wonder as being the more uh, mm. a, a deeper understanding of of what he would uh, call the sublime uh, yeah and 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 and, and that's why uh, 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 Fisher talks about beauty and and also uh, the aesthetics of rare experiences like the rainbow and why we're called to it because it, 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 it engenders wonder in us. Um, so I don't know how much I would, I, I don't know how to answer your question. Yeah. I, do see, I do see Kant as doing some stuff that was shifting things around. I do see that him, he, him making each one, like the, making epist like we, epistemology and ethics and aesthetics and we're, and you, you can learn this one and master it without having to know the other two. And that's, that's the point I'm challenging. I do think the, uh, I don't know about, you see, the, uh, Kant at least seems, seems to still be arguing that we take it seriously. My notion of entertainment, if you look at the actual origin of the word, to entertain an idea is to just hold it in your mind and sort of look at it, right? You're not taking it very seriously. What you're doing is seeing if anything calls to you so that you will then take it seriously. So I can entertain something and go, no, that's trivial, right? So enter, entertainment for me, uh, entertainment for me, it, 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 the problem we've done is we, we've lost that it is, it is primarily an intermediate s space. It's kind of like an airlock where we can bring things in and say, sh yeah, should I take them into my mind or not? And then the problem is if you just stay in the airlock, you, right, then you're, um, you, you're really lost. For me, I guess the deeper critique would be this. The problem with, for me for a Kant and autonomy and freedom, and this maybe goes into entertainment, which is, I think, oh, this is, people get really angry when I say this. Okay. I don't think freedom is an absolute good. I think freedom is an instrumental good. Yeah, I mean, you won't get any argument from me on that. Right. But the problem with, with, the, with the thing with autonomy is it emphasizes, and, and this is, this is clearly running through all of the German idealism and content, like freedom and the enlightenments about freedom and freedom and auto and you achieve freedom through autonomy and the autonomy of reason is what frees it, right, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there, there's all kinds of Kant's a titan for a reason. There's all kinds of good stuff there. But I think that has seeped into our culture, you know, there's like, the, there's, like there's decadent romanticism, there's sort of decadent, you know, notions of autonomy um, in, in that, you know, well, free, you know, freedom, it's like, that's the ultimate thing. We're, no, we're not. I, I, and I, 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 I actually don't know what people mean by that. And I don't know if they, look, look, this is a good way to understand my life. I want to lose my freedom in this way. I want my thoughts to be completely determined by what's true. Right. I want my actions to be completely determined by what's good. And I want my sensibility to be completely determined by what's beautiful. And once I'm there, I don't want to. I don't want to lose that. And, and 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 the degree to which I fall away from that is usually because of errors due to my freedom or something. Freedom isn't an absolute. Yeah. It, it's an instrumental good. Yeah. And part of what what happens is we make these things oriented towards freedom, and then they get locked into an incapacity to talk to each other because their autonomy is so important, and they absolutize freedom, which I think is a very problematic thing. And I want to say thank to both of you. Like, the thing I was feeling to, to, to say is like, when, when you share about your the work that you're doing, both of you, I feel like this real sense of like congruence and authenticity, and like the words matching the actions and sort of, yeah really living that in the world. So really glad to meet you in person for yeah, the first time properly. Yeah. And John, always.
Well, well thank you, David. It's, this has been wonderful. Um, and um, uh, like the, yeah, what, what Jonathan said, being here, the, 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 the dynamic living spirit of it has been fantastic. Um, and, and again, it's always, um, it's, it's, it's a joy to talk to, uh, mm -hmm. to Jonathan. And, um, and so I do think that I, to use the metaphor, I hear the first notes in these kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. where I hear them. Now, in the, when, when Dialogos, when the Logos really takes over and we're following it, rather than just saying what we want to say, um, that's where I start to get mm -hmm. the first sort of prairie of notes from the horizon. And so it's always uh, a privilege to do that. And I hope that what we've done will be that for other people. They can start to hear the beginnings of it. Mm -hmm.